John Burkham opened the door to his sister's house. She was spending the week taking a much needed vacation with her children on the Essex coast, and John had volunteered to look after the house for her while they were gone. As he had every other day this week, John walked through the front door and into the dimly lit living room. This time, he paused for a moment to look out the window and watch the people passing by on the street. A few moments later, he turned to head towards the kitchen, but upon doing so, he saw something that made him stop in his tracks. A man, sitting alone at the living room table with his back facing John. He looked quite relaxed, leaning forward a touch with one arm resting on the table. The man had slightly thinning gray hair and wore an old, worn blue and white shirt with black trousers and a leather belt. There was something a little bit off about the way he looked, like he didn't belong here in the 1970s. Instead, he looked like he had just crawled out of the 1930s. And the more obvious issue was the fact that there shouldn't have been anyone in the house to begin with. John was shocked, and at first he just stood there, looking at the man, thinking he may have been a robber or some other form of unwelcome visitor. He took a moment to gather himself and opened his mouth, preparing to ask the strange man who he was and what he was doing there. But as he did so, John blinked, and when he opened his eyes, the man was gone. This is Simply Strange, the podcast where anything spooky, weird, and goosebump-inducing is fair game. Hello everyone, welcome to Simply Strange episode 12. I'm your host PJ, and I hope everyone's having a wonderful day today. This week I've got a real doozy of a story for you. I've been wanting to do a paranormal episode for a while now, really since the beginning of this show, but other crazy stories keep catching my attention and it just hasn't happened yet. Not anymore. Today is the day we are going to get spooky. This week's story is a very interesting, very divisive case that's still hotly debated today. This is the story of the Enfield Poltergeist. Peggy Hodgson was a recently divorced mother of four children, two sons and two daughters. The five of them lived together in a subsidized duplex in Enfield, a borough in the northern part of London. Her oldest child, 14-year-old Margaret, was serious and reserved, you could even say a little somber. A stark contrast to her younger sister, 11-year-old Janet who was lively and extroverted and always seemed to be the center of attention. The youngest child, seven-year-old Billy, suffered from a severe speech disorder, but otherwise was a very normal little boy. And finally, there's the oldest son, John, who went to a boarding school and aside from school holidays and the occasional weekend, wasn't home very often. He, like his older sister Janet, was also very outgoing. On the surface, the Hodgson family didn't seem much different than any other family. They had their struggles, but Peggy worked hard to support the children, and they got by. She was known as a fairly timid but pleasant woman, and she had a positive relationship with those around her. Her brother, John Burkham, lived just a few houses down the street, and they were very close. And they also got along well with their next-door neighbors, who lived in the other half of their duplex, the Nottinghams. 
but their reputation as a normal family would be short-lived, and it was about to be put in serious jeopardy. As the story goes, on the evening of August 31st, 1977, the Hodgson family was getting ready to call it a night. Peggy was in her bedroom going about her nightly routine, while across the hall, Janet and John, who was home from boarding school for the weekend, had already retired to their shared bedroom and crawled into their beds for the evening. But they, being the more rambunctious of the Hodgson children, weren't exactly in a hurry to fall asleep. Instead, they lay in their beds, joking and laughing across the room to each other, just waiting for that inevitable moment when their mother would open the door and fuss at them to stop being so loud and go to sleep. But before she got the chance to do that, at around 9.30, Janet and John were instead interrupted by something else. Both children began hearing a strange sound like something shuffling slowly across the carpeted floor. They bolted upright in bed and stared at each other, each confirming that the other was also hearing the same bizarre sound. Moments later, having heard the children's volume escalating from in her bedroom, Peggy burst into the room, asking the children what was going on. They explained the sound and told their mother that they thought it might be coming from the chair in the corner of the room. This was the second night in a row that the children had stayed up late complaining about strange occurrences in their bedroom. The previous night, they had tried to convince their mother that their bed frames were shaking while they tried to sleep. But Peggy wasn't buying it. Whenever Janet and John were together, antics like this were virtually guaranteed. And this situation seemed no different. So in an attempt to quiet them down, Peggy brought the offending chair downstairs, went back up to their bedroom, and turned their light off, hoping that that would be the end of it, and Janet and John would go to sleep. As she was about to close the bedroom door, she too heard a strange sound cutting through the darkness, a slight shuffling sound, just as her children had described. She quickly switched the light back on, half expecting to see that one of her children were the source of the noise. But they weren't. Both Janet and John were lying in bed with their hands under the covers, and furthermore, nothing in the room appeared to have moved. While she was unable to explain the sound, there was clearly no one else in the room. So Peggy just chalked it up to creaky floors or some other rational explanation. She told the children to go back to bed and turn the lights back out, preparing to leave. But the room had other plans for her. Upon turning the lights back off, the shuffling sound returned immediately. And this time, it brought company. A new, much less discreet sound. Moments after she flicked the lights off, all three of them heard four loud, distinct knocks coming from the wall. Peggy flicked the lights back on just in time to see the dresser that stood right next to her, along the wall next to the door, began to slide sideways towards the door, seeming almost like it was intentionally moving to block the doorway. And then, after moving about a foot and a half, it stopped. For Peggy, this was the moment where these supposed anomalies that her exuberant children kept going on about shifted from being childish hijinks to something that was possibly very real. Certainly something that she didn't understand. She pushed the dresser back to its original position, and the three of them just stood there for a moment, silent, frozen with fear, and unsure of what to do next. And then the dresser began to move again, sliding back towards the door, and stopping in about the same spot as it did previously. But this time, when Peggy tried to push it back into place, it wouldn't budge. It was somehow frozen in place. And that was enough for Peggy. She collected all four of her children and they went downstairs, where the bewildered family took a couple minutes to gather their thoughts. At first, Peggy considered leaving the house altogether. Her brother lived just a few doors down, 
but by this hour, he'd already be asleep and she didn't want to wake him. Then she noticed that the lights were still on at the Nottinghams, their neighbors who lived in the other half of their duplex. Peggy decided that the best course of action would be to go fetch them. She enjoyed a good neighborly relationship with the Nottinghams, and Vic Nottingham was a tough but very cheerful and friendly man. He was a good person to have in this situation. He was in his 40s and worked as a builder, specializing in roof work. Upon Peggy coming over to explain what was going on, he wasn't entirely sure what to make of all of it, and he didn't really believe her. But he agreed to go look for the source of the noise. So Vic, accompanied by his wife, also named Peggy, as well as his son Gary, all accompanied Peggy back to her home, which Vic and Gary began scouring, searching for the source of the noise. They checked everywhere, all the bedrooms, downstairs, the loft, even the front and backyards, but they found nothing and heard no sounds. Eventually, when they were both sure that there was nothing and no one in the house causing the sound, they returned back downstairs where everyone was waiting. And then, the knocking started again. This time, it was coming from an outside wall, on the other side of which was the alley that separated their building from the next one over. Thinking that it might just be kids in the alley playing a prank, Vic ran outside, but there was no one out there. The knocking continued, seeming almost like it was following Vic around the house, mocking him. Even with his expertise as a builder and knowledge of how homes are constructed, Vic was unable to think of an explanation for this strange knocking moving through the house. Finally, after feeling like they had exhausted all other options, the police were called. And a short while later, at around 1am, Constable Heaps and Constable Hyams arrived at the Hodgson's home. According to the report later filed by Constable Heaps after the event, upon their arrival at the home, she and her partner found a group of people standing around in a living room, seeming very confused. Peggy told her that they were hearing unexplainable sounds, and that they thought the house might be haunted. At this point, the knocking had stopped, so Vic suggested that they turn the lights out, as that had previously spurred on the sound. So they tried it, they flicked the lights back out, and sure enough, there it was. Four knocks on the wall. Then two minutes passed, and another four knocks on a different wall. Thinking that perhaps the plumbing had something to do with it, her partner and Vic went to the kitchen to look at the pipes, leaving her and the Hodgsons alone in the living room. A few minutes later, Peggy's older son, John, pointed silently to a chair next to the sofa. The chair had begun to shake, wobbling from side to side. The entire room stared in amazement as the chair began sliding across the floor towards the kitchen, moving about four feet before eventually coming to a stop. According to her report, no one appeared to have touched it, and upon inspecting the floor, nothing out of the ordinary was found. She even put a marble on the floor to see if perhaps it was uneven. The marble didn't move. There was no explaining what happened to the chair. In fact, there was no explaining any of it. The shuffling sound, the knocking, the moving furniture. And given the nature of these events, there was nothing the police could do. There were no laws being broken and no one to arrest. So Constable Heaps and Constable Hyams left. The next handful of days were difficult for the Hodgson family. They were too scared to sleep upstairs. So everyone brought their pillows and blankets down to the living room and constructed a makeshift bedroom where they would spend the next couple of nights. Over the coming days, the strange occurrences continued and the mysterious force began flinging marbles and Legos across the house at terrific speeds. Upon landing, they would be burning hot to the touch. The police were called back to the home and, again, were unable to do anything. The bombardment continued for five days until Vic's wife, the other Peggy, 
contacted a local newspaper called the Daily Mirror. On September 4th, the Daily Mirror sent a reporter and a photographer out to the house, both of whom were able to witness the flying marbles and the Legos, and the photographer was actually hit in the forehead by a Lego flying across the room at such velocity that it left a bruise. Three days later, they sent out more reporters to cover the home, and on September 10th, an article appeared on the cover of the Daily Mirror titled, The House of Strange Happenings, detailing the Hodgson family's frightening experiences over the previous two weeks. One of the reporters working on the Hodgson case was a kind and thoughtful man named George Fallows. George took a particular interest in the case and did some research of his own in attempt to help Peggy. He was actually the first person to suggest that the strange occurrences were caused by a poltergeist, which he explained to Peggy as a sort of mysterious nuisance that throws things around and often attaches itself to children. He explained that he believed the poltergeist may have attached itself to Margaret, her oldest child, and that he had some contacts at the Society for Psychical Research that he would like to call in order to help her understand this mysterious trickster and hopefully make it go away. So that's what they did. And on September 5th, 1977, Morris Gross of the SPR arrived at the Hodgson family home. The Society for Psychical Research at its most basic level, is a group of open-minded academics whose mission is to use scientific research to investigate the supernatural. Morris Gross was a very new member of the society, and this was actually the first case that he had worked. Gross was a successful inventor. His list of patents included shelf fittings, a variety of vending machines, automatic newspaper dispensers, and those analog advertising displays that rotate through different ads often seen at bus stops and airports. He was a kind, charismatic, and likable man whose interest in the supernatural was spurred by a series of striking coincidences that occurred following the death of his daughter in a motorcycle accident about a year previously. Over the coming months, Morris Gross would become an intrinsic part of the Hodgson's lives, working with them day after day and many nights as well for well over a year. He would become the voice of reason, helping to quell their fears and becoming something of a father figure to the children. Gross later reported that immediately upon his arrival at the Hodgson residence, he could feel the crushing fear weighing down on the home a feeling that was shared by many other people upon entering it. The feeling that you aren't alone, that some unseen force is watching you. Gross did his best to try to alleviate that feeling for the family, telling the Hodgsons that usually these poltergeist encounters only last a few weeks. He also tried to shift their position from that of a victim to that of an investigator, asking them to keep an eye out for anything strange and report their findings back to him. And that they did. Over the coming days, the Hodgsons experienced a whirlwind of activity. The knocking continued, wind chimes rang with no wind, books launched themselves across Janet's bedroom at a visiting neighbor girl, doors and drawers opened on their own accord, Gross and a number of photographers from the Daily Mirror witnessed a chair spontaneously flip over twice in the middle of the night accompanied by a resounding crash. A couple days into his investigation, when Gross was thoroughly convinced that there was absolutely something strange going on here, he called for backup. And on September 12th, the SPR sent author and investigator Guy Playfield to aid Gross in his investigation. Gross and Playfield would become an integral part of the Hodgson family's lives over the next two years, as their story continued to develop and the mysterious force residing in their home began to manifest itself in increasingly terrifying ways. Over the coming weeks, the knocking continued, furniture continued to be flung around the house, and sheets were ripped off of beds at night. Their gas heater was pulled out of the wall and the pipe connecting it to the house was bent. Eventually, they tried bringing mediums in, which helped, but only for a few days. By far, 
The strangest of all of the events that plagued the Enfield family began in December, three months into the bizarre affair, when the poltergeist activity began to hone in on Janet Hodgson. She began being apparently thrown out of her bed at night, every night, as soon as she would settle down to try to sleep. Next, it would escalate into violent bouts of uncontrollable rage, where she would scream so loud that it could be heard from several houses down the street, twisting and writhing around in bed and striking anyone that came too close. When this happened, it would take the combined might of her mother, Playfair, and Gross to hold her down. And even then, it was a struggle. And then a new phenomena began. Strange barking and whistling sounds began occurring. The sound always seemed to come from Janet's general direction, except that her mouth didn't move while they were happening, and Janet swore that she didn't even know how to make the sounds. But soon, these sounds would evolve beyond just whistles and dog-like barking. One evening, shortly after midnight, Gross decided that it was time to really put the poltergeist to the test. He wanted to elicit words from it, instead of just incoherent noises. Janet and Margaret were each in bed, and Gross was in the room as well, speaking with Janet, or rather, the poltergeist that was inhabiting Janet. He turned on his tape recorder and argued that if you can whistle and bark, then you can speak and he commanded it to say his name. Up to this point, the poltergeist refused to make any sounds while he was in the room, so he left the bedroom and closed the door behind him. He briefly spoke with Playfair in the room next door, and during that time, a voice can be heard on the tape recorder. A deep, raspy voice that can just barely be heard saying, Morris. However, Morris did not hear it because he was talking to Playfair, so he went back in and continued trying to coax words out of the poltergeist, speaking to it and then waiting outside the bedroom several more times. But now his requests were only soliciting an assortment of barks, whistles, and other nonsense sounds. So he changed his approach, and instead of asking for the poltergeist to say his name, he asked it to say Dr. Beloff's name, Janet's doctor, who was waiting with Playfair in the other bedroom. Gross went back outside, put his ear up against the door, and listened. What he heard chilled him to his core. A loud, harsh voice that seemed to unquestionably be the raspy voice of an old man cut through the whole upstairs of the house. It said Dr. Bella, just as Gross had requested. Gross excitedly re-entered the room and began a new line of questioning. And from here, the voice became a bit more conversational, although not exactly pleasant. Gross and company began to attempt to explain the negative effect it was having on the Hodgson family in an attempt to ward it off. But these requests were greeted mostly by responses like no, or shut up, as well as various obscenities. Over the coming days, however, the voice continued very regularly, and it began to divulge more and more information telling Gross and Playfair that there were actually ten different people inhabiting Janet, but one in particular manifested itself in more detail than the others. A man named Bill Wilkins, who told them that he lived in this house and continues to live there. He tells them that he is 60 years old and has a dog named Gober the Ghost. He tells them that Janet's bed is where he sleeps, that Janet's bed is his bed, and he wants her to get out. This seems to explain why her bed was constantly shaking, as well as why she was launched out of it on an almost nightly basis. They are both results of Bill's attempts to get rid of her. He later goes on to say that he went blind, and had a hemorrhage and died on a chair in the corner downstairs. Interestingly enough, after doing some digging, it was discovered that there was, in fact, a blind man named Bill Wilkins, 
who lived in the house many years before. Reportedly, Bill's son, Terry, was notified of the spirit's claim, and he confirmed that the voice did sound just like his father, and that his father did, in fact, go blind, suffer a hemorrhage, and die in his sleep. Downstairs, in his armchair. Over the coming months, the phenomena got stronger and stronger. Whatever it was seemed to stop caring whether anyone was in the room or not. The voice emanating from Janet began speaking more and more often, sometimes when multiple people were in the room, sometimes even on camera. There's one particularly fascinating piece of footage that aired in a BBC documentary in which Morris Gross's son interviewed Janet and she can be seen and heard shifting between her voice and the deep, raspy, poltergeist voice. Later on, Margaret began speaking in a similar raspy voice as well, although not as loudly or as often. And there was much more going on than just the voice. Janet supposedly began levitating. Multiple witnesses say that they saw her bobbing up and down in the air through her bedroom window. There's a now famous picture that supposedly shows her floating above her bed. Apparitions became commonplace. Vic Nottingham, on two separate occasions, claims he saw what looked like an elderly woman looking out of the upstairs window. Peggy's brother claims that he saw a man sitting at their living room table one day while the family was on vacation. Young Billy, on several occasions, claimed to see shadowy figures on the stairs, or faces staring through the window, at one point claiming to see an old man with big white teeth who utterly terrified him. On multiple occasions, the living room curtains reached out and wrapped themselves around Janet's neck in an apparent bid to choke her. Fire started, spoons bent, fecal matter was found smeared on the walls, cameras and tape recorders constantly failed, the list goes on and on. And the thing that makes this case particularly unique is the fact that throughout all of this, everything was being recorded, or at least attempted to be recorded. The Enfield Poltergeist is widely regarded as one of history's most well-documented paranormal events, and for good reason. By the time Guy Playfield arrived, the Hodgson home was crawling with researchers. Journalists and photographers from the Daily Mirror continued their attempts to chronicle the events and capture strange happenings on camera, while at the same time, Gross and Playfair were doing their own research, recording every little detail of the events, and capturing over 180 hours of audio recordings, which included the knocking and the voice. Playfair later wrote a book aptly called This House is Haunted, logging every little detail of the experience, which was my main source for this episode. This book is 281 pages of pretty much non-stop descriptions of the events that unfolded in the Hodgson home. Hundreds of different occurrences. We would be here for hours if I tried to elaborate on all of them. So there's a lot of information out there in the form of reliable eyewitnesses by a number of different people the family, the investigators, police, the media, neighbors, and also in the form of recorded documentation, like photos and audio recordings. But then on the other side, we have skeptics who criticize Gross and Playfair for not having done a thorough enough job in documenting the events, and for being too gullible, falling for childish trickery. And they do have kind of a point. Gross and Playfair do seem a little too certain in the honesty of the Hodgson family. The piece that stands out most to me are the famous images of Janet levitating above her bed, which, if viewed one after another, look a lot like a girl simply jumping off her bed. Skeptics also argue that Janet could easily have been making all of the demonic voices herself using false vocal cords pointing to the fact that oftentimes she speaks with her hand near her mouth partially covering it. 
It's difficult to believe that all of these anomalies are legitimate, but at the same time, they seem extremely difficult to fake. So, what do you believe? Is there any merit to this poltergeist? Was Janet truly possessed by the spirit of Bill Wilkins? Or is this a case of two overly gullible supernatural enthusiasts being duped by a 12-year-old girl? In October of 1978, a year and a few months after the haunting had begun, Playfair and Gross were starting to wonder how the story was going to end. Every day seemed to be worse than the last, and no matter who they brought in, no one could help. They were beginning to worry that there wouldn't be an end, that they may spend the rest of their lives on this case. But then they received a letter from a Dutch journalist by the name of Peter Liefhaber. He was the editor of a Dutch weekly called Extra. He said that he specialized in psychical research and he wanted to do a story on the Enfield case. At first, his letter almost went completely ignored. There was a constant barrage of journalists wanting the inside scoop on the Hodgsons. It was time consuming and they usually got it all wrong anyway. But one day, on a whim, Playfair decided to call Peter anyway. They had a long chat, and Peter seemed to be truly interested in the case. He had done his research, and he even offered to bring a medium with him to try to help stop the activity. This was very appealing. A few days later, Peter and his medium, Dono, arrived in Enfield. Dono was impressive. He was soft-spoken and pleasant, but commanded a quiet confidence that Gross and Playfair immediately picked up on. According to Peter, Dono had already ended two Dutch poltergeist cases, and they were very confident that he could end this one too. His techniques were every bit as unobtrusive as he was. He spent most of his time at the Hodgson's just walking around, quietly observing, or sometimes tucked away alone upstairs. At one point, he requested to spend some time with Janet, and the two of them went up the street and he bought her ice cream. And then, at the end of their first day at the Hodgson house, Peter and Dono returned to their hotel. Dono is a very mysterious figure. Information about him is vague at best. And the next bit is a little unclear. But the story seems to go something like this. Upon their return to the hotel, he spent some time in a sort of trance-like state, visiting what he called the Astral Sphere, where he encountered a 24-year-old woman. Next, he ran what Playfair referred to as a psychometric test on a photo of the Hodgson family that he had recovered from their home. This test revealed that this same 24-year-old woman was somehow associated with Janet Hodgson, and then the next day, he spent some time with Morris Gross, who he believed had a very strong aura about him. An aura that linked him to the events unfolding at the Hodgson's home. And in their conversation, he discovered that Gross's daughter had recently passed away. His daughter, who was also named Janet, and would have been 24 years old were she still alive. According to Playfair, after his discovery of this information, Dono simply said, well, that's it. It's your daughter. Two days later, the Dutchman returned to Holland, and the poltergeist activity immediately fizzled out. wrap for this week's episode thank you so much for listening this was a weird case and even after spending the last two weeks soaking in as much information as i could find about it i still have no idea what to think but i'd love to know what you think 
So definitely reach out on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Simply Strange Podcast. So reach out and let me know what you thought about this case. And if you want to, maybe tell a friend about the show. If you know someone who is equally as into weird and wild stuff as you are that might enjoy it. And I think that's all I've got for you guys this week. I hope you found this episode to be enjoyable, and I'll be back in two weeks. Have a beautiful day.